Hey guys, welcome to that pedal show VCQ. Dan here. Ziggy here. Mick here. Hello. So Mick's away in Greece at the moment, um, but we've spared no expense and uh, through the marvels of technology, we have hooked Mick up via video link. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, let's get started. Do you want to go down? Go down? Right. Uh, the videos we did this week, we had uh, the board build with Josh Smith and we also had the volume pedal show. Uh, Jimmy Valentine says, is there a place to easily find the specs on the current volume pedals? Um, he learned about the specs on the video, but he's having trouble finding out what the difference is between brands. You need to go to the specific volume pedal you're looking at, go to the manual, and on the manual there'll be a technical sheet or a, a data sheet. Um, Generally, it's right at the end, and it'll have the input uh, input impedance, and should tell you if it's buffered or not. Transteganu, is there any difference between using a passive attenuator or a volume pedal in the effects loop? Well, you know, it's whatever you want it to be. Uh, yes, there is, because an attenuator goes between the output of the amplifier and the speaker cabinet and it attenuates the entire amplifier, including the power amp section. The volume pedal sits between the preamp and the power amp and just reduces the amount of signal that goes from the uh, preamp into the power amp. So they're quite different and you get different results. With an attenuator, when you create the amplifier, you're hearing the, the output section being overdriven as well. Um, but you don't get that with the volume pedal between the preamp and the power amp. We had loads of comments on the four input uh, trick that I used um, and also lots of love for the jazz hands diagram. So let's see if we can uh, use some diagrams and help with these questions. Uh, Johan Abu, uh, Phil McDay and Paul Yama Hamstring. Uh, just a quick question on the four input system with the output two going to the delay in the volume pedal. So let's break this down. The signal is going from my pedal board to the input, the high input on channel 2, needs to be the high input, not the low input. Then out of the low input of channel 2, we're going into the memory man, then out of the memory man into a volume pedal, and out of the volume pedal into channel 1. Now, when I come out of the pedal board into channel 2, this is my direct sound, and the volume on channel 2 becomes the volume for my direct sound where it splits and then goes into the memory man, the volume pedal, and that goes back into channel one. Now channel one is the overall volume for the memory man going back in. Ben Lovely and Lido 000000 says, you guys mentioned phase between the different channels of the four input amplifier, the Vox and Plexi, etc. I confused them what you meant, and how do I know if they're in or out of phase? Don't sweat the little stuff, man. It's all about the big picture. Yes, the two, the two channels can be out of phase, but that's only an issue if they are receiving exactly the same signal, or at least uh, the same signal as far as time is concerned. So um, if I'm mixing in a fuzz or you know, something that is you know, basically the same signal, um, there's no time difference, then yes, the phase will be important, so it's important that they are in phase. However, this trick with the delay because I'm only mixing in the wet part of the delay, there's no direct signal there. So it won't matter if the two channels are out of phase. And Mike Nelson, similar question, will Dan's two channel 100% wet volume trick work on a Vox AC15 with a normal and a top boost channel? Uh, cheese is always top stuff. What Mike is asking um, with the Vox, the normal channel on a Vox and the top boost channel are out of phase. The top boost channel has an extra gain stage, uh, which flips the phase. So if I was just blending in two of the same signal and I turned up one channel, you'd actually the volume would get quieter because as those signals mix, they are cancelling each other out. However, if I'm just turning up that channel and it's just the repeats of the echo, then it'll be absolutely fine. Right. What do you reckon, Mick? Ogzand says, thanks guys, great episode, very enlightening. I'm having my mind blown uh, by realizing the potential of my dual channel AC30. Any other tips and tricks you have for dual input amplifiers? Um, there are a few, we've got a few tricks up our sleeve. I think we might actually do a, a video dedicated to 
that style amplifier and a few things that you can do with it. It's very cool. So Traffic Joe and Samsung says, hey guys, quick question on the resistance of the volume pots. If the pedal still sucks some tone using a 500k ohm pot, would it not be better to build volume pedals with even larger resistances? Well, where would be the disadvantage in putting a one mega ohm pot? Great show as always, cheers. Um, yeah, you could use a one mega ohm pot. I, I personally wouldn't use a volume pedal on the input anyway. I always have it after um, my drive section and therefore it doesn't really matter because it's always receiving a, a low impedance signal. Simon French says, Dan, interested to know if you ever watch rig rundowns for guys like Eric Johnson, John Harrington, John Mayer, etc., um, and your OCD kicks in and you think, oh man, please get in touch. Uh, not normally, Simon. N nothing that I do is new or unique. I'm, I'm, st I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, to be honest. Uh, and these guys generally uh, have really have this stuff sorted. But there have been times I've seen pedal boys as going, yes, please get in touch. Um, one of those times was with uh, Ed O'Brien when I saw a rig, I saw a shot of his pedal board, and he did get in touch, and that was awesome. So, but yeah, I have wished for it. It, it has happened, uh, but generally, you know, most of these top players really know what they're talking about. So, guys like Eric Johnson, who has one of the greatest guitar tones ever recorded, I'm not going to go up to him and say, "Hey, man." I'm pretty sure I can get you another, you know, 10% on top of that. Um, great tone is where you find it. Casey Nowy and Chris P. Bacon says, Hi there from the Netherlands. I love the show. What about the effect of a volume pedal before a compressor? Uh, so it's the same concept as putting the volume pedal before an overdrive pedal. The, the compressor is basically limiting the dynamic range of the input signal. So the input will go in, and as the, as the input falls, when you're backing off of the volume pedal, um, the compressor will be doing its thing and compressing, and you won't hear any difference until it be falls below the threshold of the compressor, and then it will start to drop. Um, so generally, a, a volume pedal before a compressor, um, I'm sure there are some people out there that are going to say, I do it and it works great, brilliant. Um, depends on the threshold and how much compression is actually going on, but generally, for me, after compressors and overdrives. Uh, Moose212 says, I have a question. I read before that the reason you get tone suck from passive volume pedals is they're adding another load in parallel path to ground, which drops the effective resistance to ground. Um, so, okay, yes, so if you've got a 250k pot in your guitar and you've got a 250k volume pedal, then those resistance values are being added in parallel. Now when you add resistance um, values in parallel, you halve the resistance. Okay, If you add them in series, you double the resistance. So what happens in parallel, when you halve the resistance, you are effectively with a 250k pot and the guitar and a 250k volume pedal, you halve it, it becomes 125k. So yes, that is the reason that you get the tone suck, because you have a lot less resistance to ground, therefore uh, a lot more top end will go through. He goes on to say, I modded one of my guitars to let me bypass the volume pot, and I found this seemed to work great when using it with my, um, with my volume pedal. So yeah, that can work great. The only thing to remember is that you, do, you still have that capacitance between that and the, um, the volume pedal, but if you are bypassing the volume on your guitar and going straight to a volume pedal, that can work great as well. Um, a few questions on the specifics of volume pots. Jules Music says, does the value of the pot in a passive volume pedal, such as the Ernie Ball um, Volume Pedal Junior, 250K affect my tone even when it's all the way up in 100% toe position? Uh, yes, it does. Even when it's all the way up, the, the 250K refers to the amount of resistance that's going to the ground in its most open position. Same with the 500K. As you back that off, it becomes less resistance to ground, letting more signal flow to ground. Um, but in this in this toe position, that is the maximum resistance, is that 250k value. Uh, John Laurie makes a comment and says, for any fellow lefties out there, um, volume pedals are a good way around the annoying logarithmic volume pots that we get stuck with. Um, that's really interesting. I didn't know that about left-handed guitars having log pots in there. 
Uh, generally, if you use a, an audio taper, which is another word for the logarithmic pot, it means that you get there's an it sounds more even as you go through the the entire range of the pot. Whereas with the normal linear one, um, you get that thing that lots of the volume gets turned down within just a few first few millimeters of, that, of the turn, which is what we're used to as guitar players. Yeah, so Snip Snap Doggo says, read the top end loss on volume pedals. I've seen some recent ones come out from the likes of DOD with a treble bleed mod and no need for power. Uh, Mick, do you want to go through that one? It's all right, Nick. Take it easy. I got this. Um, the treble bleed uh, mod is a really popular mod, especially for guys using humbucker guitars. Um, basically, it's a capacitor set up in parallel with the volume pot, and as you turn the volume pot back, it always lets a bit of uh, top end through. Very similar to a bright cap on on your amplifier. Um, so yes, you can absolutely do this with a volume pedal. Um, so that it allows more top end frequencies through. It's not a magic bullet because there are, if you just use the capacitor and you have the volume pedal all the way back, then you still have top end frequencies that are, that are going through. So it won't do the completely off thing. Um, but there are different sorts of uh, treble bleed mods that you can do and different circuits. So check it out and uh, have a go at the one that's going to work best for you. And also lots of people referring to Jimmy Herring as the ultimate volume pedal user. His rig is really interesting, so worth checking out. Um, on to Josh Smith's board. Josh Smith was in the UK uh, a few weeks ago doing a tour, and I built his rig for him. Um, this, this is a rig we've been talking about for a year, uh, just sort of getting our, our ideas together. And it all had to come together very quickly. Um, so normally a rig like that would take me you know, a week or so to build, but we had two days to do it, um, so it was a long two days. G Walker says, usually I don't love board build shows, except for when you are building Josh Smith's board, then I really, really, really love them. That's great, G. Hot Rat says, Dan, what amps are you using? When I was in here testing the the board, we were using my Laser J J20 and the Hampstead. When Josh was playing live, he had Super Reverb and a Two Rock Traditional Clean. Right, Alpa Ademi says, hey Dan, is this the most complex board you've ever built? Thanks for the great content. It is one of the most complex. I've certainly built very complex boards, but the amount of MIDI and everything going on with this board was um, amazing. So it's certainly up there. Uh, Paul Whitaker says, I saw Josh Smith last night at the borderline. Um, all this work that went into the board has paid off because he's never heard such a great guitar tone. Uh, that's, that's great, Paul. Yeah, and I saw um, Josh playing in Bristol. And I mean, he's... The guy could plug into anything and sound amazing, but the way that he uses his gear is just superb. 2421EI says, Dan, quick question, does Josh have to beam his own tone print into the flash pack every time he uses it? Um, no, they're stored. Yes, once you beam it in, you can turn it off and turn it on and that you're still using that uh, tone print. Stefanos Tsantilis. Says I will be stealing licks from this video for the rest of my life. Uh, as will I. As will many of us. Um, some superb playing. Okay. Finally, Casey Burke says uh, Josh Smith is refreshing because he is a true tone hound. Uh, many pro guitar players have trouble explaining the signal flow and specifics of their gear, but Josh is the kind of dude who seems to have the user manual in his head for every pedal he owns. Um, love this video. Uh, uh, thanks, Casey. Uh, yes, Josh is so switched on. He understands that to get the most out of his gear, that he needs to understand how it works. Um, and, you know, Josh does a lot of session stuff. Um, he has talked about his love of the H9, which does so many things. So he's really got to grips with that side of technology, which is, and you know, when he incorporates things like the HX Stomp, um, he has no, no trouble sort of delving in deep and really getting to understand how to use it. Um, so yeah, it's wonderful. When you hear him play, you know, and he, you can you understand that level of, uh, of understanding of his gear and how that goes into shaping the sounds uh, because he has this, the palette that he has when he's playing of the palette tones is, is just wonderful. There you go, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I uh, just want to send Mick and Catherine some love. They are out in Greece at the moment, but they are looking after 
Catherine's mum and getting her house ready for the summer. So Mick, the only person I know that could possibly go to Corfu and spend the week just working his butt off. Have a good week. Oh, finally guys, we are also doing a gig this Thursday in Froome uh, at the Cheese and Grain. So it's Thursday the 4th of April. Uh, that pedal show band, we're going to be doing a, a live set. Uh, Mick and I will also be going through our rigs and taking questions. So if you want to come down, uh, the links to tickets are in the description below. So that's at the Cheese and Grain in Froome this Thursday. Brilliant. Have a fantastic week and hope to see you soon. Bye.